we got some tough acts to follow, man. <laughs> we sure do. Can y'all give it up again for Reverend Durley? <laughs> so it's such an honor to be here with you uh, this evening. And, and I know everyone uh, is excited uh, about the new movie um, that's out, uh, but also about making real change and, and embracing uh, our power and, and how change can happen. And I actually uh, took another look again at Inconvenient Truth and then the sequel. And the interesting thing is I thought about something that Dr. King shared with us many, many years ago. He said, he said that we come to these shores on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. And it was interesting because as I started to, you know, think about uh, the impacts that are happening and how sometimes we silo and segregate ourselves mm. and how we're there now. And you know, we're coming up on the 12th anniversary of Katrina, uh, August the 29th, um, and, and I was there on the ground. Um, but we also have places like Princeville, North Carolina, uh, founded by uh, African slaves um, and just had a hundred year flood. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and places like Nichols, uh, South Carolina, same thing. Um, why is this uh, movie so important at this moment in time? Well, uh, Mustafa, I want to join you in thanking uh, and acknowledging all the speakers that came before and uh, Dolores and, uh, and, and Gerald Durley and Tom Steyer, who, who gave such a, a wonderful address, and Pamela Chomba. And I want to thank Eric Thutt and Mary Rickles and the entire Net, Net, Netroots uh, Nation team for doing a wonderful job. And thanks to all of you. So the work that you've done for so many years, Mustafa, actually embodies uh, one way to answer the question you've just asked. Because environmental justice mm -hmm. and climate justice mm -hmm. is a cause that connects what we are doing to the environment and to the climate and the, the prejudice and the insults to people, people communities of color, people uh, and communities of low income. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they have less means to defend themselves mm -hmm. when people want to locate a new hazardous waste site or when they are looking where the downwind plumes are for some terrible uh, polluting facility. Yeah. Uh, and, and this has been going on for a long time. But we are now seeing the, the, the growth of this same issue on a truly global basis. Mm -hmm. Today, we'll put 110 million tons of man-made global warming pollution in the sky. You talk about violence. Violence not, is not just a, a metaphor. It is that too. But this kills people. It hurts people. It, it, the cumulative amount that's up there traps as much extra heat energy every day as would be released by 400,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every 24 hours mm -hmm. on this planet. And it's a big planet, but that's an enormous amount of energy. And it is radically transforming the ecological system of the Earth. Not just raising temperatures, which, by the way, in some regions of the Earth are themselves a, a dire threat. There was a, uh, a heat index in a city in Iran not long ago of 165 degrees Fahrenheit, 74 yep. Celsius. No one can live outside for more than five or six hours, no matter how healthy. It's also disrupting the water cycle, and you're talking about these rain bombs. Mm -hmm. You know, last week, both Miami and New Orleans were flooded out and paralyzed, not by the ocean, although that the sea level contributed this time, but so much of the ocean's water vapor is being boiled into the sky that when it comes over the land, we get these historic downpours. Seven inches in two hours in Miami last week, week ago Tuesday. Nine inches in 12 hours in New Orleans. And in both cities, the pumps holding the ocean at bay failed because of the event. And both cities were paralyzed. There are many such events 
all over the world on a regular basis. Every night on the TV news now is like a nature hike through the book of Revelation. And the news media often does not connect the dots, but individuals are beginning to, and we must. Because here's what's at stake. The large carbon polluters feel that they have a right to use the sky as an open sewer. And they want to they continue using the sky as a sewer for as long as they can get away with it. Now, it is, it, and it, it's an issue of poverty because those with low income, low income nations and low income computer, uh, communities within wealthy nations cannot defend themselves, not nearly as well and sometimes not at all. So, just as environmental justice focuses our attention on the violence that is inflicted on those who are disadvantaged, this large pattern that is now global is inflicting violence that is unjust and must be halted. But the carbon polluters are using the same techniques that the tobacco companies used years ago. You remember when the doctors made it clear that smoking cigarettes causes lung cancer and other yeah. diseases. They, they hired actors and dressed them up as doctors and put them in front of cameras to falsely reassure people that there was no health problem. Mm -hmm. And 100 million people died before we finally got over those deceptions. The large carbon polluters are using the exact same playbook. They have hired many of the exact same PR agents and they are trying to fool people to the point where it's incapable of the political system to, to respond. Netroots Nation embodies the awakening of a new consciousness that has to spread all across this country to demand that we do go back to a government of the people and by the people yes, yes. and for the people. Yes, 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 yes. So let me ask a couple questions. I'm going to set the notes down here. We're going to have some real talk. All right. <laughs> okay. So you talked about this new awakening that's happening, and I agree with you on that. Um, you know, we had the Women's March. Yeah. We've had the, the Science March. Um, and we had the People's Climate March. How important are those moments that are a part of a movement in moving us forward to be able to address these issues. Oh, it's, cru it, it's crucial. Uh, and one of the lessons that uh, Netroots Nation has taught is that connecting to one another on the internet is extremely important, but we have to connect to one another in person as well, mm -hmm. because that's where the real deep ties come that can build the commitment necessary to keep going yeah. and, and to ultimately prevail. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let's take this just a step further. So we currently have an administration who does not feel that science is valuable. So I saw science all throughout both of the movies. And can you just speak a little bit about how important that is? And then also, how do we begin to translate science into everyday language so that Mrs. Ramirez or Mr. Johnson, who I often speak about, feel the connection in that space? Well, the, the phrase, uh, speak truth to power, mm -hmm. uh, embodies the essential formula that you're getting at here. Mm -hmm. The truth that the scientists have worked real hard to uh, find out and double-checked and triple-checked and mm -hmm. verified uh, with their observations in the real world, the, the truth is still inconvenient for the carbon polluters and the politicians that they totally control lock, stock, and oil barrel. Mm -hmm. And so they want to hide the truth, distort the truth, confuse and distract people into ignoring the truth so that what we can see with our own eyes and experience with our own senses and, de and, de and learn about with our reasoning capacity cannot be effectively used as a source of political power. They want money to be the be all and end all of political power. Our democracy was hacked by big money before Putin hacked mm. our democracy and we need to take it back. And, 
and, and, and let me say a, a word about the Bernie Sanders campaign, and I don't want to get into the agenda or the issues. I, I want to make a, a simple point about what he and those working for him proved last year. Mm -hmm. We have reached the point now with internet-based and social media-based communication and grassroots organization to where finally it is now possible to run an effective and potentially victorious campaign mm -hmm. without accepting any money from fat cat billionaires or special interests or lobbyists, right. but just get it from the people, from the internet. Right. Yes, sir. Now, let me say one other thing on this. I went to the Congress, I'm old, I'm old. In my mind, I'm not. In my mind, I'm younger and thinner and I have dark hair. But, I went to the Congress in the mid-70s, yeah. and I watched this change. Mm -hmm. And when television became these awful 30-second commercials, all of them negative practically, I watched the behavior of elected representatives of the people change radically. And most of you all know what goes on now. The average elected representative in the Congress, House and Senate, you know what they do all day? They spend an average of five hours every single day begging special interests and lobbyists and fat cats for money. Now, what does that do? It's a question of human nature. Mm -hmm. Our founders were humanists. They understood human nature mm -hmm. with crystal clarity. Mm -hmm. What that does to them, the, the people who are supposed to be representing us, and you know, God bless the ones that are steadfast in spite of all that, but, but so many of them, what that does to them is they begin naturally to think about the impact of what they say and do, not on the people they're supposed to be serving. Mm -hmm. They begin to think more and more and more about the impact on those telephone calls the next day to the begging special interests and fat cats mm -hmm. and lobbyists. And pretty soon, they're letting the fat cats and the lobbyists and the special interests write the legislation, say, here, introduce this. And they take it straight from their lawyers and lobbyists and say, you know, uh, presiding officer, here, here's my bill. It's not their bill. The, the special interests have got a degree of control now that is toxic, and it is a disgrace to what American democracy is supposed to be about, and we need to take it back. All right. Okay. Yeah. So as I was walking around uh, over the last couple of days, some folks came up to me and they said, Mustafa, I know you're going to be blessed to be on stage with uh, the Vice President, and I got a couple of questions that I'd like for him to answer. So the first one was, and it's a, two, a twofer, if you will. All right. One is around the, Claris, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement, All right. and the other one is around the Clean Power Plan. Okay. Um, and our current administration not seeing value mm -hmm. in those spaces, let me say it that way. Mm. So. Can you share with folks, one, what does it mean when we have an administration that moves away from the Paris Climate Agreement? Mm. And if the Clean Power Plan you know, is not kept intact, mm. what do we do in those spaces? Extremely important question. And I will tell you that when Donald Trump made his speech on June 1st announcing that he was going to pull the U.S. out of the Paris Agreement, mm -hmm. I was very concerned, for one thing, that some other countries might use that as an excuse to pull out themselves. For another thing, that it might paralyze the willpower of states and cities and businesses and civil society here. But I will tell you that the very next day, in my faith tradition, it says, joy cometh in the morning. All right, okay. The next right. morning, the news came that the entire rest of the world had redoubled their commitments to the Paris Agreement, as if to say, we'll show you, Donald Trump. Right, 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 right. right. And the governors, the governors of our largest states and many other governors besides, uh, and hundreds of mayors of cities and 
a lot of business leaders who have made these commitments, they all doubled down and they said, we're going to meet the Paris Agreement regardless of what Donald Trump says. In his speech, you recall, he said, I was elected to represent Pittsburgh, not Paris. Well, the next day, the, the mayor of Pittsburgh said, well, I'm the mayor of Pittsburgh and we're still in the Paris <laughs> Agreement. He did. He and did. we're going 100% renewable. Yes. So, two more, two more points. Sure. Um, it now looks as if the United States of America is very likely mm -hmm. to meet the commitments made by former President Obama under the Paris Agreement, regardless uh, of what Trump does. One other detail, a lot of people don't know this. The way the Paris Agreement was written, and this is not entirely a coincidence, the first date upon which it is legally possible for the U.S. to be withdrawn happens to be the day after the next presidential election in right. 2020. <laughs> yeah. And if we have a new president, excuse me a minute. <laughs> a new president can simply give 30 days notice and we're back in. Right. So it could be just a right. speed bump. Yes. Now, the clean, you asked about the clean power plan. Yeah. That, that's a little more complicated. Right. And I don't want you to, to give anyone the impression that Trump's not capable of doing a lot of damage. He is. He's working overtime because he's surrounded himself with this rogues gallery of climate deniers beholden to the large carbon polluters, and we all know that. And they're secretly working to try to change everything they can and fire the scientists and uh, get rid of any regulations they can. Mm -hmm. But the good news is that this train has left the station, and what I mean by that is the cost of electricity from solar and wind is coming down so fast, mm -hmm. uh, and, and now it's got its own momentum. And the more of them they build, the, the more the cost comes down. Electric cars are now becoming way more affordable. Batteries are coming down, uh, LEDs, hundreds of efficiency technologies. The world is now in the early stages of a sustainability revolution that has the magnitude of the industrial revolution, but the speed of the digital revolution. I truly believe it is unstoppable. And this movie, by the way, uh, tells the story uh, in part of it uh, of Georgetown, Texas, which is described by their mayor as the most conservative Republican city in the most conservative Republican county in Texas. And he is a Trump supporter. Uh, well, he was and may still be. I don't know. I didn't get into that with him. But he happens to be a certified public accountant, and he knows arithmetic really well. And he did the calculation and decided to completely convert that city to 100% solar and wind electricity. And now their bills for electricity have come down, the air is cleaner, and it's kind of a side benefit that they're helping to save the future of humanity. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we, had, we heard uh, Reverend Durley earlier speak a little bit about morality. Hmm. Do you feel that the climate issue is a moral issue as well. Absolutely, at its heart, it never should have been a political issue or an ideological issue. It is a moral issue, it is a spiritual issue. Mm -hmm. Of course it is. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of what's doing, uh, of doing what's right is greed. Mm -hmm. Greed and the manipulation of facts to conceal the truth in order to distort what our democracy ought to be deciding in order to serve the interests of, of uh, these special interests. So of course, uh, and not long from now, mm -hmm. the next generation will ask one of two questions, depending on the decisions we make in this time period. If they, if they have tropical diseases uh, spreading uh, uh, northward and in, in the southern hemisphere, southward, into where the big populations are, if, if there uh, is chaos and uh, civil unrest because governments can't govern themselves in these conditions, if there are stronger floods and deeper droughts and more powerful storms and the melting ice and sea level, all of that stuff, what would they think about what we did to leave them with that? 
Uh, that's a moral question, and we would see it if we had a time machine and could go into the future and be with them when they're just asking, what in the world? Mm -hmm. Why? As I said on the screen, couldn't you hear what Mother Nature was screaming at you, much less what the scientists had found out? Yeah. But there is another alternative. If they find themselves in a world with a full sense of renewal, with tens of millions of new jobs in sustainability. Solar jobs in the United States today are growing 17 times faster than all other jobs in the economy. The, the single fastest growing job is wind turbine technician. If we made a decision to put people to work in every community, retrofitting buildings, residential, commercial, and industrial to get that 25% that's just completely due to wasteful construction and design. Those jobs can't be outsourced or sent to some other country. We need to get our economy going in a healthy way and provide good jobs. And if the next generation lives in a world where that's going on, yes. and, the, and, and the, the climate is once again healing and they have hope in their hearts and they can look at their kids and, and feel genuinely their lives are going to be better. I want them to look back at us in this time and say, ask a different question. How did you find the moral courage and resolve to stand up and do what many said was impossible? Yeah. And part of the answer to that question will be that Net Roots Nation helped to lead the way all across the United States and we provided leadership and got it done. Yes, 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 yes. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the climate movement itself now. Yeah. Um, and you know, what you just talked about was so important. So I think it's important that we begin to break down silos, that we begin to expand the base yeah. um, if we're going to win on climate. So, you know, I come from Appalachia. People find it hard to believe. You grew up in West Virginia. I then. surely yeah. did, yes I did. Oh, some folks from West Virginia in the house. All West right. by God, Virginia. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. yes. How do we connect with folks who are in Appalachia, maybe who have been working in the coal mines or other yeah. fossil fuel industries? How do we connect with folks who are in the Rust Belt or in the, you know, in the breadbasket of, of our country? How do we connect with them? Yeah, well, by providing jobs, for one thing, and by telling the truth about what has happened to them because the job loss in the coal industry came mainly because the coal companies mechanized heavily and replaced labor with these machines that slice off the tops of the mountains and, and despoil the, the beautiful landscapes, and you've seen it in your native West Virginia. And then the fracking gas came along artificially cheap and kind of finished off uh, most of what remained of that industry. And then the coal, uh, the people that owned the coal companies turned around and said, well, it was the environmentalist's fault. Yes. No, it was not. But then we have to go well beyond telling the truth about what happened and tell the truth and follow up with an organized plan to get them the better jobs that they deserve with the training and the opportunities. Look, we have a lot of work to do. And you, you know very well this becomes kind of a cultural and political tribal type issue where people use the same phrases and if you don't use that phrase, you're on, in the other camp. We've got to break that down. The good news is that it is beginning yeah. to break down. Uh, and, and we're seeing, but we have got to be determined about creating these new job opportunities. Mm -hmm. These coal miners that have lost their jobs, how, what do you feel about them? I know what, what most of you do and what we must feel. They and their families in previous generations really did help to build this country. They didn't have any intention to create the climate crisis. They, they were fulfilling good jobs for good wages, and it's not their fault right. that they have now been left in this situation that they're, they're in. Yeah. We all have to work together through the instruments of self-government to create the, the new opportunities. Right, right. So I also want to talk about, because we're going to talk about expanding the base. I want to go back in time just a little bit, and I don't know if everyone knows this, but how instrumental you were in relationship with other sort of stakeholder leaders in creating Executive Order 12898, which is known as the Environmental Justice Executive Order. Um, and I'm curious if you could share with folks 
why you invested that capital in that space, because it's directly tied to the climate movement right now, um, and, and why vulnerable communities needed to be a part of the mix, if you will. I'm, I'm proud of the role that I played, uh, and uh, well before that executive order, I, I uh, sought out uh, Congressman John Lewis from here in Atlanta, one of the great heroes that's ever lived in this country. Mm -hmm. And uh, John Lewis in the House and myself uh, in the Senate, we introduced the first environmental justice bill that was ever introduced. And, and actually, that was in the first half of 1992. Sure. I had no... Yes. Uh, thought at all that maybe, you know, what happened later that year, me joining the ticket and becoming vice president would happen. But then uh, one year later, when Bill Clinton and I went into the White House, I uh, convinced him, which was pretty easy to do, to set up this uh, task force. Mm -hmm. And then that led to that environmental justice uh, executive order yes. and you were already in EPA and you were the one that put it into effect and start, <laughs> started doing the work. Right. But uh, right. Mustafa's right. been at this a long time. But, but let me make one other point. Yep. The idea for it mm -hmm. didn't just spring uh, out of, you know, spontaneously. Right. It came from the grassroots. That's right. And as far back as 1980, Two, mm -hmm. in a rural community in North Carolina, yes, a community of poverty and color, woke up to the news that the powers that be had decided to bring truckload after truckload of hazardous chemical waste and dump it right mm -hmm. in their community. Mm -hmm. Well, why their community? Because they did not have the connections. They didn't have the wealth. They didn't have the political influence. But for the first time in American history, they went out and laid their bodies down on the road they to did. block those trucks from, from bringing that waste there. Yes, and that event kind of ignited a new awareness uh, of this uh, environmental justice cause. And it started, it's, the knowledge of it spread around the country. I started uh, hearing about it. John Lewis started hearing about it. Mm -hmm. So it really did come from the grassroots. Yeah, and, and, and that is a moment in time that sort of translates into where we are now. So when I'm talking about expanding the base in the climate movement, we know that there's still a lack of diversity in the leadership in many of our yep. organizations that are focused in right. that space. Um, and that if we're going to win, then that means that we have to be inclusive. Absolutely. And we have to make sure those ideas and innovation are in that space. Can you talk a little bit about the need in that space and also talk a little bit about the Climate Reality Project and, 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 and the trainings that you've been doing um, and how you're addressing that issue? Yeah, the C Climate Reality Project holds uh, a regular training programs uh, to over th a three-day period to give people from the grassroots the skills and training they need to effectively mm -hmm. persuade their elected officials and many of the ones that go through the training go on to do other things too, starting uh, renewable energy businesses, becoming, you know, elected officials. Mm -hmm. uh, the woman who ran the, the Paris conference, Christiana Figueres, was a yep. graduate of this training program back in 2007. Uh, and it's to build a cadre of activists at the, the grassroots level. I'll tell you a quick story about one. Next training, by the way, is in Pittsburgh uh, this fall. And if anybody wants to, uh, to consider being a, a part of that, thank you, thank you, all right. Uh, Climatereality.org, uh, uh, you can yeah. sign, you know, get your name on, on the list. But I, we, had a, we had a training uh, in the Seattle area, Bellevue, Washington, uh, just a short time ago, and before that, Denver. So I want to tell you a quick story. Mm -hmm. At the Denver training, an 11-year-old girl showed up mm -hmm. to be trained. Mm -hmm. And I said to my staff, now, we are, what's our policy here? Are we sure that this girl is old enough to do this? It's sort of like somebody running an amusement park with a bar. You've got to be taller than this bar before right. you yeah. go on the ride. Yeah. But I saw her over three days making careful notes. And two weeks later, after the training was over, I clicked on a video that was going viral on social media. And here is this same 11-year-old girl mm. 
who has gone to a town hall meeting of her Republican congressman in Colorado Springs, and she's got her iPad and the microphone, and she's just giving him hell on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, I, but, but I don't want to skip by the first part of your question because yeah. it's extremely important. Yeah. We have to have more diversity in the climate organizations. Right. Right. Uh, we, we have to reach out to all communities. I want to tell you about one of our uh, board members who's made a tremendous difference for us. Her name is Catherine Flowers, and she's from Lowndes County, uh, Alabama. Yeah, Lowndes County. Uh, yeah. You know her, and, and she, she is amazing. And my uh, oldest daughter, Corinna Gore, who, who you know well, introduced me yeah. to Catherine. I said, I've got, she's got to be African-American yeah. in, a, in a very low income, rural county between Selma and Montgomery. Mm -hmm. uh, and she, she was a veteran of the Air Force mm -hmm. and she, she is a powerful advocate, organizer, woman. But I have, the, uh, I and the others at Climate Reality have learned so much mm -hmm. from her perspective and from her passion and from the experiences that she, you know, this sounds kind of trite, but it's an example really of the tremendous benefits that the environmental movement writ large needs to take advantage of by reaching out to communities of color and every single demographic group in this country so that, so that the environmental movement looks like America. Yes, 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 yes. We can clap for that. Real talk. So I'm going to take us in a little different direction okay. right now. So, you know, the civil rights movement was a transformational moment, and music played a huge role uh, in that as well. Most, some folks don't actually pay as much attention to that. So I was, someone asked me the question when I was coming down the escalator to ask you, so when you were growing up, mm. who were those musicians that were instrumental? What was the music that you were listening to? Now this to? was in the pre-hip-hop era. This is pre-hip-hop, it is, it is, it is. Okay, so you gotta cut me some slack when I, 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 I have, answer. I have, I am, I'm gonna take okay. you there, but I'll, okay. Well I will tell you, I'll give you, it's, it's very easy for me to answer yes. that question. There, yes. were, there were a lot of songs, but I remember um, when I was, boy, I don't know, maybe 12 years old, 13? Yeah. Years old, growing up in the summers in, in the South, yeah. when the Civil Rights Movement was gaining momentum. Yeah. I will tell you that when Bob Dylan sang Blowing in the Wind, mm, and those words really pierced right into my heart, everybody's so familiar with them now, but when that first started being played on the radio, I had never heard anything like that, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I started hearing more songs that had that uh, element of conscience and truth telling, mm -hmm. and it made a tremendous difference. And I remember during those days, I remember a, a moment when one of my friends in this rural community made a, kind of a quasi racist comment, and one of my other friends said, Hey, shut up, man, we don't talk that way anymore. Mm. And there were, I'm pretty sure, millions of conversations that were a little bit like that. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that's really important is to use your voice. I mean, organizing, using your vote, influencing the political leaders, that's absolutely crucial. But using your voice and being unafraid to speak up and win the conversations mm -hmm. on climate. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll give you another example. Uh, the gay rights movement. Mm -hmm. If somebody had told me even five years ago that in the year 2017, gay marriage would be legal in all 50 states and that two thirds of the American people would accept, honor, and celebrate gay marriage, I would have said, I sure hope so, but you're pretty naive, that's unrealistic. <laughs> now why did it happen? It happened, first of all, because the Human Rights Campaign did a hell of a job and a lot of grassroots organizers. <laughs> but it also happened because, once again, millions of conversations were won. It happened also because as that gained, mo as the truth of, the, of what was right gained momentum, lots and lots of gay and lesbian Americans 
decided and found the courage to represent themselves as to who they really are. And their friends and coworkers and family members said, oh, 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 okay. Yes, yes, <laughs> and, yes. and then it wasn't far from there to the, to the emotion. Well, if God made people this way and that way, God could not have intended this person or that person to be persecuted for his or her whole yeah. lifetime. What the hell difference does it make who you fall in love with? Let's just get on with this. We're all Americans. Right. And that has been a healing, yeah. yes, yes. a healing. Now, the climate movement is right at that point. We are right at that tipping point. And I, I don't want to repeat myself, but what the gay rights movement, civil rights, all these other movements have in common mm -hmm. is that it can seem a as if the resistance can't be overcome. Nelson Mandela, mm -hmm. the late Nelson Mandela said during the anti-apartheid movement, he said, it's always impossible until it's done. Right, right. And it seems impossible to some people now. It's not. We just need to get it done. We're very, very close. Yeah, so you're saying people have power. People have power, and the truth is a source of power. Yes. Not to get into the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi, but he had a word I won't try to pronounce that they say translates into truth force. Yes. And we have all seen in our own lives how we have the ability to feel what's more likely to be true than not. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you really feel it deeply mm -hmm. and sink into it and without fear represent it, it has a, it has a force mm -hmm. that changes things uh, and, and can move mountains, really. Yeah, and I'm glad that you raised you know, truth and power. I think they're important. Yesterday was the 44th anniversary of hip hop. You know, it's been around yeah. for a while now. Yeah. And the beauty in that space uh, is talking about culture. It's talking about sharing the stories and realities uh, that everyone is dealing with. You know, individuals like Jay-Z and Beyonce, but mm. also individuals like Taboo of the Black Eyed Peas, uh, who uh, actually has a video out right at, now. At, at Standing Rock. Standing up, stand up for Standing Rock. Is everybody with that? Yes. And, and don't forget to go out and vote for that video also at MTV. I, I appreciate that. But you have individuals like Chance the Rapper also, yeah, um, yeah. Vic Mensa, Antonique Smith. As we're talking about expanding the movement, mm. how much does culture play a role uh, in making sure that people are one, respected, and two, feel included uh, in the process? Oh, it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely crucial. And of course, music in particular has mm -hmm. uh, an ability, as we all know, to, to move hearts and minds in ways that words alone cannot. We all know, know that. And maybe that's why you started down this yeah. road yeah. Uh, uh, and asked about the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And let me mention the, the original song in this uh, new yes. movie, An Inconvenient Sequel, Truth to Power. Ryan Tedder of One Direction and T-Bone Burnett, yeah. who's my neighbor and buddy in Nashville, co-wrote a song called Truth to Power, which really embodies that uh, Gandhi-type deal. And, and the, the, the hook is, I've seen truth turn to power. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's trending now. It won't be in the same awards category <laughs> uh, as Taboo, so it's okay to promote them both. That's right, that's right. We'll try and get them both an award, how's that? <laughs> so, you know, uh, I know we're short on time, um, but there were a couple of other questions that uh, folks asked me to ask you. And one of them is the general question that we have to be able to answer it. How do we win on climate? Well, first of all, we have a big ally, uh, and that's Mother Nature. Mm -hmm. uh, these climate-related extreme weather events really and truly, unfortunately, are a lot more common mm -hmm. and a lot more destructive. And there is a lot of evidence now that people who might uh, put themselves culturally on the other side of the political divide on yeah. climate yeah. may not feel comfortable using the phrase global warming or climate crisis, are finding their own language mm -hmm. to express what their senses are telling them. Uh, it started big time with all the professions that work outdoors all the time, farmers, ranchers, yes. fishermen. Yes. 
but now it's spreading more widely than that. But in winning these conversations, that's a big part of it because the resistance, you know, um, sometimes there are people that just fly into a rage if, you, if they hear the phrase global warming. It's almost like a dysfunctional family with an alcoholic father who flies into a rage if somebody mentions the word alcohol. So the, the rest of the family just kind of tiptoes around without ever talking about the elephant in the room. And I think sometimes the news media worries that they're going to lose uh, 7 to 14 percent of their viewers changing the channel if they even talk about global warming. And by the way, it's an embarrassment to our country that we just went through the third quadrennial presidential election cycle in a row without one single question about climate being asked in any of the debates. That is a disgrace. But you, we all can help change that and insist that the conversation take place and that we win that conversation. This movie, the reason why uh, I want to encourage as many people as possible to see this movie, it opens this weekend all over the country. 100% uh, of the profits go to train more climate activists and there's a book of the same title on the New York Times bestseller list now. Uh, this week, 100% of those profits go to train more climate activists. But the more people who go to see this, the more chance we have to build a stronger, more effective climate movement. And I'm proud that we're, we're working with uh, not only the Climate Reality Project, but 350.org and NRDC and EDF and Climate Hawks uh, and a bunch of other groups who are organizing around the theaters where this movie is being shown in, in many cities, not every city, but in many cities. So learn about it, use your voice, use your vote, go to the town hall meetings, call and knock on the door of your congressional representative and government officials at every mm -hmm. level. You all know how to do this, it's Netroots Nation, you right. know how. To. Oh, we're working with the Indivisible uh, group also. They are, they're go. big time organizing. And, and, uh, and this, this week, uh, Indivisible has targeted 14 uh, cities specifically, uh, big cities where the movie is, mm -hmm. is opening and they're at every showing in, in all of these 14 cities. I love the Indivisible movement, by the way. And I will tell you that there's a two-part message that really works with elected officials. Maybe you already know this. Um, but uh, part one, uh, you tell them how important the climate issue is to you and tell them that if they're going to do the right thing, you, you'll, you'll support them. Part two, but in order to make part two work, you got to first of all decide deep down that you mean this. But part two is to tell them that if they vote with the polluters instead of with the people, just look them in the eye and say, I promise you, that I am going to do everything in my power to contact as many people in your district as I can possibly contact, and I'm going to beat you and kick you out of office in this next <laughs> So when the movement is successful, yes. when the movement is successful, because I don't believe there's any other alternative. We've got, to, we've got to do it. What will our country look like? What will the planet look like for our grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren? I have to start with a really candid expression sure. that regrettably some damage has been done that uh, cannot uh, be rolled back. Right. Um, some sections of Antarctica and Greenland have now crossed a point where they will continue melting mm -hmm. no matter what. Uh, some temperature increases will continue. Uh, some of the other changes. But it's sort of like, uh, you know, if somebody is a heavy smoker and has been for 40 years and goes to the doctor and says, Doc, I've been smoking three packs a day for 40 years. I just guess there's no point in me quitting now because mm -hmm. my fate is sealed, right? right? And the doctor will say, no, that's not right. Here's what it sh the medical studies show. If you quit now, your chances improve. 
year by year by year. Now to come back to climate, what the scientists tell us is, yes, we put a lot of this stuff up there, and some of it will be there for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. But if we could magically stop putting any man-made global warming pollution into the atmosphere tomorrow, how long would it take for half of it, 50% of it, to mm -hmm. fall back out of the sky? Right. 20 years. 20 years. Okay. Now, that means a lot of it would still be up there. And so the, the, the truthful, realistic answer to your question is, we have done some damage. But far more significantly, the scientists tell us there is no doubt that we do still have the capacity to avoid the catastrophic consequences that would threaten the future of all human civilization if we, uh, if we did not take control of this. Mm. Now, let, let, let me just say one other thing about that, because this can sound abstract. It's a planetary deal. We're talking about the future. Just let yourself sink in, into this realization. We're taking a risk that the next generation will see the gates of hell open mm. and ask of us why we had no, no concern about what was going to happen to them. We're taking that kind of risk. Well, you asked earlier, is it a, a moral issue? You bet it's a moral issue. Um, and it's already affecting us now, so it's a practical issue as well. Yeah. So, you know, closing question. I have heard you speak about power, and we've had a lot of conversations over the last few days about power. At the Hip Hop Caucus, we talk about power mm. and how that translates, you know, into real change actually happening. Talk to folks a little bit about, you know, do they actually have power? Yeah. Uh, now, again, Good news and bad news. Um, the good news outweighs the bad news, but I'm going to give you the bad news first. It is true that big money now has an extremely unhealthy degree of influence over the way our political system operates. And there are some uh, elected officials who are so under their influence, they're so controlled by the big money that it's hard to imagine what turns them around. Mm -hmm. But the good news is that bar that we have to clear with, with people power may be a little higher now, but we can clear it. Mm -hmm. We can clear it. Look at what many of you did earlier this year when that uh, god-awful... Uh, healthcare proposal mm -hmm. was put forward by Trump and the Republicans in the Congress. And on their first break, they went to their town hall meetings back home and all hell broke loose. Sure did, we sure did. And, and, and some of them who, you might have thought they were in that camp where they were so in the pockets of the special interests, they were lost. They came back and said, I've got to change on this issue. <laughs> My constituents are restless. Yes. yes, 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 yes. They're mad. And if I don't change, I'm worried I'm going to lose my job. Mm -hmm. So it can be done. There is strength in numbers. There is strength in the connections that the Netroots Nation makes and that the meetups and the physical connections make with leadership and determination to go and get this done. Yeah. Some people say, well, I don't know. I'm just not sure that we have enough political will. Mm -hmm. But here's a a powerful secret. Political will is itself a renewable resource, and all we have yes, to do is, is to yes, renew it. Is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. All right. All right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, folks are, are curious about Charlottesville. I know you know that your, your father actually um, was a, you know, very engaged around civil rights, actually stood up um, around the Southern Manifesto. One of only two senators to refuse. He made some mistakes, yeah. but he was a powerful advocate for the Voting Rights Act. And yes. what happened in Charlottesville just uh, today, well, last night with that march and mm -hmm. then the great tragedy yeah. today and Reverend Durley uh, uh, led us in prayer and we should remember the person who lost his life and uh, the, his or her life. I'm not right. sure whether I, right. I haven't. It was her. her. A person who lost her life and 19 uh, injured and some of the injuries are, are serious. There's a lot to say, and I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm picking and choosing what's going to be most useful mm -hmm. to say or what might be of most value. There's a vigil outside right now. And uh, yeah, yeah. what did you say back there? There's going to be a vigil. Uh, okay. There, yes. there, there's, yeah. a vigil, there's a vigil outside, but, but I, I, do want to, I, I do want to say that our country is facing um, a dangerous time with the rise of some of these hate groups. And I, I, I waited for uh, President Trump to make his statement. They said he was gonna come out at three o'clock and everybody else came out and they set the stage and waited and waited, waited. and. I, I, he, he was deliberating. Mm -hmm. And then when he came out, uh, he, he did not say anything about the fact that neo-Nazis and the KKK were, and the alt-right were out there trying to provoke uh, hatefulness mm -hmm. and divide people. And I was surprised that the statement uh, appeared to give a kind of uh, moral equivalence uh, to the people who had organized this uh, KKK Nazi yeah. uh, march and the people who said, we're gonna stand uh, against fascism and Nazism and racism mm -hmm. and we don't want that in, in our community. Mm -hmm. They're, they're not equivalent. I don't know about the fistfights earlier in the day right. and uh, violence on both sides. I don't know, but I do know that it was a terrorist act yeah. on the part of the person who drove that vehicle. And, um, and on the off chance that uh, my words here could could reach President Trump, I would say, Mr. President, uh, uh, for the sake of our country, I would urge you to, uh, to try again on a statement. I'm, I'm serious now. I don't mean it as a laugh line. I'm serious. We're in trouble here. And we'll get through it okay. But this is a, this is a really a troubling time. And, I, and I, I say in all sincerity to the President, I would urge you to give more thought to what it means to have a resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan and the Nazi movement marching and creating this kind of hatefulness. Mm -hmm. He said he wants us to uh, have affection for one another and love one another and have a good time. That's what his statement was. And uh, Mr. President, that's not enough. That's not enough because the, the people who are in this alt-right, KKK, Nazi uh, group, they're not interested in building affection for other Americans. They're not interesting, interested in loving all people. They're interested in provoking hatred and using uh, prejudice uh, as a way to divide the, the, the country. Uh, so, 
we need, we need to speak out against this, and the country would be better served if the president would come back before the people and make a more thoughtful and appropriate statement about how we should understand what's going on there and how we can go forward as a nation. Yes, yes. My grandfather always said that leadership matters um, and uh, what you do in that space is super important. We want to thank you for your leadership. And I think that we should also, um, because this is the last session here at NetRoots, um, I think that we should send a message to the country. So I'd like everybody to stand up. I'd like for you to look to the person to your right. Don't stare. <laughs> look to the person to your left. I want you to reach out your right hand to the person on the right-hand side and grab the person on your left-hand side. Take their hand, all right? Because as the Vice President, thank you so much for everything you've done. Thank you. And I want you to realize something. I think the Vice President shared this with us. There are two sort of powers that are in our country. One of them, if we're going to have real talk, has been money. But the other one has been the power of people. And if you look around this room tonight, you see black folks, you see white folks, you see Latinos, you see indigenous folks, you see Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, you see gay and you see straight. You may see wealthy, and you may see those who are still moving up the ladder, if you will. The real power that exists inside of our country is when we are willing to actually touch each other and remember that we are all human and embrace our humanity. I want everybody to reach your hands up above your heads and say power. 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 Say power. 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 One last time, say it like you mean it so they hear you all across Atlanta and all across our shores. Say power. 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 I want to thank you all for being here this evening and thank the Vice President. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Great job, man. Great job. Thank you. Thank you.